Welcome to the World Nomads podcast, delivered by World Nomads, the travel lifestyle and insurance brand. It's not your usual travel podcast. It's everything for the adventurous, independent traveler. Hey, thanks for hitting play on this episode of the World Nomads podcast, in which we're off to Portugal. I am Kim, and Phil is about to fill you in on why, did you get that? Um, why it's a destination a nomad will love. Sunny summers and mild winters, streets filled with tiled facades. Portugal is just a few hours' flight from most European cities. Whether you visit to, to hit the beaches or cycle through the parks and reserves, it's the perfect destination for getting outdoors. It's also got perfect tubular waves. Surfing is hugely popular and the uh, country hosts some of the biggest surfing events on the calendar, including the Rip Curl Pro, and it's famous for its port-style wine. Tra- yes, I've tried to help out there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Piri Piri Chicken, yeah, helped out there too. And football. Oh, yeah. If you're into football, just think Cristiano Ronaldo. Uh, one of the things that travellers notice most is the hospitality and friendliness of the Portuguese people. Well, in this episode, we will explore the Azores. Take a walk into a volcano and get some tips on experiencing Portugal from a local, including Sandra. Now, she runs a blog called Tripper. It was on her site that I came across an entry titled Travelling to Lisbon. Read these 10 things first. Now, Sandra writes that Lisbon, Phil, has become so popular and trendy that things may have gotten a little out of hand. I think there's this big difference between uh, what we locals feel and what there's, there's three perspectives. We have the locals, we have the tourists, and of course we have the government who obviously runs everything. And the perspectives are completely different. For locals, it's starting to be a bit too much. Uh, for the government, we still have lots of room to grow. And for tourists, obviously Lisbon is wonderful and sunny and uh, affordable and whatnot. Uh, I don't think we're at that level like in Barcelona, for example. Not yet. I don't think we've reached that uh, danger level, but we should actually do something now before we get to that. I feel quite guilty then sharing it (laughs) with with the rest of the world, but why has Lisbon become so popular? I actually don't, I don't know, there was a time like uh, during the economic recession in let's say 2011, uh, 2013, around those two years, Um, people lost their jobs, companies were closing down, we had a massive uh, amount of of people immigrating to uh, London and other other cities in in Europe, and those who were left behind, the only thing they had was actually tourism. So in a way, tourism saved the Portuguese economy. Everyone says this, and and I also believe that. Because we already have the product. We don't have to think too hard. We have wine, we have food, we have the weather. So, and everything else followed. It was like all the online publications were discovering Lisbon. They were writing about Lisbon and it just blew up completely. Um, and uh, then we have a massive uh, event, which was the Web Summit, which is Europe's largest uh, internet conference if you like on all the startups so it brought more people and for Lisbon to have between 30,000 and 50,000 people in five days it's a lot I remember everything was chaotic Uh, metro was chaotic like hotels restaurants bars everything was too much and I don't think people were giving were given enough time to prepare that is the issue um Things have to be done a little bit more, well, sustainably. But why do you feel guilty? You were saying you felt guilty for sharing? (laughs) Well, yeah, you're telling, you know, everybody that, okay, here's this special place in the world that hasn't quite been loved to death, but it's fabulous, it's popular. It hasn't yet. Yeah, so go along and love it to death. That's where I'm feeling some (laughs) some guilt from. (laughs) No, I don't think you should. I think uh, I actually, once I started to be very open and vocal about it on the blog, because the the, the first intention with with Tripper was not at all to write about uh, sustainable tourism. That that wasn't my focus in the beginning. It was just a general, generic travel blog. And then suddenly I started uh, seeing all the misinformation about Lisbon, you know, all the same articles over and over and over about the same things. 
people giving wrong information. And I started writing a few blog posts and I realized people actually wanted that uh, local connection. They wanted to feel, okay, we are traveling there, but are we adding to the problem instead of the solution? And so I actually get emails from readers asking me, how can I be more uh, responsible when traveling to Lisbon? How can I be more conscious? What should I do? Which businesses should I support? So there is a concern. So how do you be a responsible or conscious traveller to, to Lisbon? Oh, very hard question. Um, first of all, figure out why are you travelling to Lisbon? Uh, because if you're here for um, the food, maybe you're not interested in visiting museums. If you're here for the art, maybe you're not interested in going on a food tour. And what I think is like people don't have that much time to travel and they try to just pack everything into three or four days, sometimes less, and try to do as much as they can. And it's not sustainable for us. It's not sustainable for those who are visiting. And uh, it's like that rule, do you know the rule that you should never look for a restaurant when you're starving because you might fall into a tourist trap? That's the same with traveling. If you're like too eager to see everything and go to everything, you'll end up probably seeing nothing that you came here for and maybe leave with an idea like, oh, you know, it wasn't that, you know, this was okay, but it was not what people told me about. I think that's very important. I think we... Uh, many times we don't stop to think, like, why are we traveling to this uh, specific location? Is it because it looks good on Instagram? Is it because you actually uh, enjoy the history of the city or the local culture? You, you have to, to ask that question first. And then, obviously, like, uh, try to see which businesses support the kind of traveling you want. Well, in your blog, you do say that there are a number of places that you can skip in Lisbon, but sometimes it's hard for a traveller, for example, to go to Paris and not see the Eiffel Tower. I know. That was a very, very difficult post to write. It also brought me a lot of hate mail. <laughs> well, not hate mail, but hate email. Lots of people telling me. Uh, I know it's, it's a very controversial post, and obviously, if you go to Paris, you have to see the Eiffel Tower. If you come to Lisbon, you have to see the Santa Justa lift, for example. What I do say is that I listed six places that you can skip visiting inside most of them, because most people don't know this. And then they join those large queues and they stay in queue for hours, uh, and then they get inside. It's nothing what they expected just because the guidebook or told them to, or TripAdvisor told them to, to travel there. Um, those six places I mentioned to skip are actually those that you can actually skip visiting inside, not going to them, to be, to be clear. And you also say, and you mentioned food earlier, that you know one of the first things that pops into your mind might be sardines in Lisbon, but keep in mind they're not fresh the whole year round. They're not. That's the biggest tourist trap in Lisbon. And sometimes I notice this, usually the, I think, fresh sardines, I don't want to get the dates wrong, but it's, it's especially in the summer. So between June and September, let's say, those would be fresh, like, like guaranteed fresh sardines. Um, but I've seen this happening in, in, in restaurants, seeing restaurants serving frozen sardines and telling tourists they're fresh and because they don't know the difference. Sometimes they're good. I've eaten uh, grilled sardines that are frozen. It's it's fine. I just don't like the way they sell them to tourists, like trying to convince them that they're having some authentic like local dish when, it, when it's not. So I'm curious as to why you would get some negative feedback about, about this particular um, blog. It's actually really good advice. Most of the negative feedback came, came from locals. They, they mentioned like I was... Uh, going against what Lisbon had, the best things that Lisbon had. And I don't think those are the best things that Lisbon has, but those are the same people that probably will complain about how there are many tourists 
on the places they used to go to. So it's you cannot please everyone. It's impossible. Well, it's a very thorough article, um, even down to recommendations on where to buy sustainable and local souvenirs in Lisbon, which again is, is an issue that's topical. Especially for tiles. Uh, I've seen so many blog posts and articles telling people to buy tiles in uh, the flea market, and that's the last thing you should do because most of the tiles are actually taken off historical buildings and sold and broken. It's, it's it's very, very, very complicated. So you're not actually helping because they only sell them because there are people buying. If you stop buying, they will obviously stop selling them, I hope. That's, that's the goal, at least. And World Nomads has a great article we'll share in show notes, The Ethical Traveller's Guide to Souvenir Shopping, because we all want to be conscious consumers. And that was a great tip from Sandra when visiting Portugal to end there. Okay, speaking of articles, Sam Bedford, who's joined us on the podcast before, has written a story for us on his journey inside a dormant volcano in the Azores. Well, it's the only volcano in the world where you can actually walk inside and walk down the steps, walk through some of the lava chambers and actually stand inside and look up out through the point where the lava once exploded a few thousand years ago. This sounds like an episode of Scooby-Doo. <laughs> Seriously, you can be inside a volcano? Yeah, but it, it gets better. Go on. Inside, there's a, um, there's a section that they call the cathedral, which is essentially a magma chamber. But because of the acoustics, the people on the island sometimes host a concert inside. So you'd have an orchestra coming down inside this volcano, then playing whatever because of the acoustics and perfect, which makes it the only volcano in the world where you can watch a concert. Wow. And some people actually get married inside. So whereabouts is this? Where, this? Whereabouts in Portugal is this? This is on Terceira Island, which is part of the Azores, out in the Atlantic Ocean. And is it hard to get to this place, or is it, you know, pretty easy and very <clears throat> popular once you're on the Azores? Actually, no. Um, I found it very difficult to, to even find information on the place. Everything online is all in Portuguese. So you have to you have to physically translate the pages to English and then try to get the information. To be honest with you, I don't think it gets the hype that, that it deserves. A lot of people just think then going into another cave, and it's not. It's it's a dormant volcano. There's three ways that you can get there. Either you join a tour from the main town on Tosaira Island, which is Angra. A lot of people drive. They'd rent a car from the airport, drive around the island, see the sides, and they'd stop by the volcano as just one stop on many. And, hey, mate, what about the people on the Azores? I mean, it's so far from Portugal. I know it's Portuguese territory, but what are they like? Are they, you know, a distinct sort of racial group, or how does it work? They identify as Azorians. Um, they, they don't like it if you classify them as Portuguese. Okay. The Azores, them are an autonomous region of, of Portugal, a bit like Madeira. Ethnically, they, they're Portuguese. Now, last time we spoke to you, you were in Portugal, but we were chatting about the Malaysia episode. So was it this experience you had at that time we spoke, or is Portugal a kind of go-to destination for you? When we spoke last time, we were just getting ready to go to the Azores. We came back to the UK for Christmas, and we've decided to go around Europe for a couple of weeks and Portugal was for choice. Fantastic. Nice recent experience. Good to hear. And also in Portugal in the winter, it's not too cold. Now, the article that you wrote for us on Malaysia on the Malay Basin is is very, very popular. So we're guessing the one that we'll share that you've written on this volcano will be just as popular. And we haven't even, Phil, touched on the freshwater lake with Sam. I want to know. Tell me about this lake. So from the top of the volcano to the bottom is about about 100 metres. And on the outside of the volcano, you've got all of these moss and lichens and all these spongy like plants. So when it rains, and it rains a lot there, all of these plants on the top, they absorb the water, and this constantly drips down through the, through the rock. And so when you're standing inside, it's always raining like a drizzle from all the water dripping constantly from the, from the top. So all this drains to the bottom, 
and it, it's made a little a little lake. When it rains a lot, it can get up to about 25 metres, and during during the droughts, it can completely dry up. There's there's no life in there. You won't find any fish in there. Actually, the way the volcano was was discovered is a is quite a quite a funny story. Essentially, about 200 years back, it was just a hole in the ground, and and the early farmers they didn't know what it was. It was just a black hole in the ground, a bit like a sinkhole. And it came to their attention when they started noticing the sheep were disappearing on the field. <laughs> <laughs> but they were falling in the hole, or what? Exactly, they were falling <laughs> down the hole. The turn of the nineteenth century, a few a few people went down on ropes, had a look inside, found it was a volcano, and so then the farmers started using it as a as a dump. It was only in the nineteen sixties that they started to turn it into a bit of a tourist attraction. The geologists came and they started to to actually study it. Sam, thank you very much, mate. Good to talk to you again. Thanks for having me on again. <laughs> Okay, what's travel news, Phil? So I write quite a lot about travel safety and talk about it in the media and what have you. And one of the things I try to convey is that safety is relative. If you're a first-time traveller and you've got no experience of the world outside of your hometown, you have a different risk profile than, you know, MacGyver or James Bond. So you should choose your destinations accordingly. So I'm not sure how I feel about this. A French tour company has begun offering cultural trips to parts of Syria. Ooh. Yes, yeah, Syria. Okay. Covered or not? Uh, I'll get to that. Okay. All right. The tour goes to South Damascus, uh, Latakia, and the Crac de Chevalier, which is a preserved medieval castle. Clearly, this is all a long way from the fighting in eastern Syria. Dam- Damascus is tucked away in the southwest corner of the country. It's only 50 k's from the Lebanese border. And it's probably perfectly fine or at least accept- acceptably safe to go there. But I'm not sure how they're going to get travel insurance because, Kim, as you rightly ask, uh, it's a do-not-travel country. Most of the foreign uh, governments around the world ha- are advising their citizens that they don't go there or if you're there, you should leave immediately because of the danger. Now, that may be different in South Damascus. You would hope it would be. Yeah. But you're not going to get covered. You're not going to get travel insurance. We can't sell you a policy to a country against the advice of your government. So, yeah. that look, I wish them luck. I would love for, you know, the history of Syria to be available to people again, but I, I think this is probably a little bit early. I like the idea, but I'm not sure how practical it is. We'll wait and see. Uh, gay travel site Spartacus has named its most LGBT-friendly destinations for 2019, uh, Sweden, Canada and, drumroll, Portugal! Yay! Portugal's topped the list. It was in 27th position uh, last year, but Spartacus has decided that changes in legislation and greater protection for LGBT people deemed it worthy of moving to the top of the index. Another reason to go there. Great. A Japanese-trained physician who now works in Australia has called for more education about health risks for travellers to Japan, especially with the uh, 2020 Olympics being held in Tokyo. Do you know fun fact about that? Go. There are, well, there are heaps of fun facts. The medals are going to be made from recycled mobile phones. Seriously? I'm serious. Yeah, I suppose there's a lot of gold and silver and stuff in those. Yeah, they're, they're, these games are going to be super – these are games you'd want to be on the ground for, not necessarily for the Olympics, but to see how they're doing it, the, the tech involved. Okay, well, I'm about to throw a spanner into this works. All right, what are you going to tell me? Uh, This uh, Japanese-trained doctor, whose name is Dr Kobayashi, says that the medical system in Japan is not well understood by visitors and the Japanese physicians are not keen on um, examining foreigners because of the language barrier. And she's also very concerned about the influx of visitors during the Olympics and that they'll exacerbate a problem the country has with syphilis. That's uh, a sexually transmitted disease. It is an STD, yeah. Uh, the doctor says in Japan syphilis has been significantly epidemic with a number of cases now 10 times higher than 10 years ago. And she says the majority of the patients are in their late teens to early 20s. Now we're talking about 7,000 people in the entire country, but that's, you know, still a... <laughs> My watch just wanted me to know if I wanted to fly to Japan. <laughs> If you heard that in the... Is that the Google... Yeah, you get, it's my, Google Apple watch. Watch. my Apple Watch just heard me say something about Japan and just told me the conversion rate for the 
Dollar to the yen. Well, I would have been more impressed if, if it had booked about you a, syphilis. Yeah, if it had booked you a doctor's appointment. <laughs> oh, okay. Hey, what's the longest you've ever been delayed, Kim? Oh, uh, six hours. Spare a thought for the passengers on the Coast Starlight Amtrak service from Seattle to LA recently, which got caught in the Cascades Mountains in those storms, that, uh, snowstorm that they had. The train was halted in position for 36 hours. Oh, that's murder on the Orient Express stuff, isn't it? Yeah. Look, the engines were still running, so they got heat and light and power and what have you, but they were starting to get a bit peckish. Just a little bit peckish. Thanks for that. So we've heard of the Azores, the Portuguese archipelago in the North Atlantic, but what about the Algarve, Portugal's southernmost region? And James, we need to know, why does it have so many festivals? Uh, that's a great question, actually, because um, I did a, a blog post recently about all the different events in the Algarve, and there was just so many, um, and so many small little ones. There, um, especially small little uh, food festivals. There was um, there was one for um, for snails, the, uh, one for a certain type of sausage. Um, there's one for sardines, and these are sort of dotted throughout the year. There was one really, really bizarre one that was the festival of the pine cone where people, um, they go on this big long walk to another town and shout, long live the pine cone in Portuguese as they leave and ring the church bells and go to the next town and have lunch and come back. And that seems to be uh, the whole festival. I'm, I'm in. That's my kind of festival. Well, I think we've got our name for the podcast, Portugal, long live the pine cone. Yeah, I think that's definitely a good one. <laughs> A lot of people probably wonder how different Portugal might be from its much larger neighbour, Spain. Is there a lot of difference? Yeah, uh, yes. Uh, yes and no. I mean, to us as, you know, English speakers and non-Mediterranean people, it can feel like they're very, very similar, but you, do, you don't want to say that to a Portuguese. And the longer you spend here, the more you start to see the... Um, the differences, like uh, the food is um, slightly different, the attitudes and way of life are different. Spain's quite a sort of happy and noisy country. Um, Portugal's a little bit more um, conservative and uh, they uh, tend to be uh, a lot quieter, a lot more sort of introspective. Um, They have this thing uh, that's very important to Portuguese culture called... um, uh, Sodad, which is um, uh, which is a difficult thing to explain, but it's a sort of wishing you were in another place, basically wishing you were another place in your life, somewhere in the past, or um, sometimes even in the future, and just feeling a longing for that, which sounds a little bit like depression to the rest of us, but is um, just a key part of the Portuguese uh, sort of mentality. So quiet and introspective, is that why it's, and I did not realise this, known for its yoga retreats? Recently, there's been a lot of different types of tourism starting up and uh, yoga is one of them and surfing holidays is another. Uh, Often people come to to Portugal to learn a new skill, um, to learn to paint or to go on a walking holiday. Um, And I I think this type of tourism is quite good. It's quite, you know, it's quite small, um, but it's usually uh, a lot more responsible, a lot uh, greener. um, And I think, um, you know, probably... A very good thing. Also, I'm interested in Ferraguedo. Ferragudo. Ferragudo. Okay. Because we've had... Yeah. Um, <laughs> Your first attempt <laughs> <laughs> at an accent. <laughs> and it's the one word that doesn't really have one. <laughs> okay. um, we've, we chatted to Sandra earlier who, who talked about... Portugal being at risk of being loved to death. So it was interesting with Ferragudo. <laughs> that yeah, very good. It's, yeah, it's great. Uh, right up my alley. Um, that it's the least developed. That's the way you describe it on your blog. Can you explain explain that? And is it therefore an attractive place to visit? Yeah, I think so. Um, certainly for um, the the sort of centre of the Algarve, it's um, it's developed, it's got tourism, but they've done it very nicely. Um, there's always, you know, the first 
towns where people came in uh, into places like Spain and Portugal, and they just went a little crazy with the sort of the um, the, the construction. But Ferragudo, it's um, you know it feels very nice. It's very attractive. It's one of the most um, picture, uh, picturesque towns on. Uh, the Algarve, I think, along with Tavira and uh, maybe Faro as well. That this is the perfect place to go off and, uh, you know, actually meet up with some locals, go and maybe uh, do a bit of woofing on a farm or something like that? Exactly. You're start, um, with Ferry Goody, you're starting to get into the western Algarve. Um, so the Algarve is, is kind of split into three sections, the eastern, the central and the western. And the central is where the majority of the tourism is. Um, the western Algarve then, which Ferry Goody is right on the border with, is, um, is a lot more rural, um, it tends to um, have a different type of accommodation down there, a lot more of um, the sort of yoga retreat type places. Um, the beaches down there are, are stunning and usually um, not very busy. Um, it's definitely a part of the Algarve that I would recommend going to. And another thing I want to get, I'm, I'm just sort of trying to paint this picture, I guess, and it may be incorrect of it being this, fabulous place that it, that you visit if you want this holistic experience we've talked about the yoga and and heading to somewhere where the crowds aren't but then there's also a place where you can go where there's you know spas that have healing properties am, am i trying too hard to create a picture of of portugal that is all about you know health and well-being it sort of exists uh if it exists in little patches. So, um, for example, the um, Monchik, uh, which you're talking about, is this mountainous part of the Algarve, which um, is, it has these healing springs and um, it's a beautiful area for walking. Then maybe the next couple of towns along will be quite touristic, but then you head on to uh, the western Algarve and you'll start to find more smaller, quieter towns and uh, more of a what you're saying, this sort of um, holistic accommodation or holistic retreat. So it's sort of dotted around at the Algarve and dotted around the whole of Portugal. Was Kim expressing, what's the word, saudade? What was the word? Was she expressing a longing for a type of Portugal that doesn't really exist there? <laughs> quite, quite possibly. I think she nailed it. <laughs> After talking to Sandra and she's sort of suggesting the place is being loved to death, I just want to make sure, Phil, that everyone knows that there is a quiet <laughs> corner where you can do a bit of omming, okay? Okay, all good. There has been a lot of um, tourism to Portugal over the last few years. Is, is that what Sandra is talking about? Yes, and um, the, she says that Portugal is embracing it, but the, at the same time uh, a lot of the businesses get frustrated by the, the number of tourists. So Lisbon in particular and Porto have had huge numbers of um, tourists over the past uh, couple of years. And the city is really, really quite small and not able to um, to cope with it. And um, in Lisbon, it was very badly managed um, in terms of just... Uh, uh, the number of people that they allowed to rent out apartments on Airbnb. And so it's created this housing crisis where people are moving out or the Portuguese people are moving out of the cities, uh, out of the city centre because landlords are renting their properties uh, short term instead. Um, so, yeah, so the, that is definitely happening in um, in parts of Portugal. Yeah, just on the public transport, I read that they try and encourage tourists or travellers to stay away from it in the peak hours of the morning and the evening so that workers can get to and from work without any hassle? Yeah, well, I mean, if you think of uh, Lisbon, I don't I don't know if you're familiar with it, but the, the quintessential type of public transport here is these tiny little wooden trams. They're really, really beautiful and entertaining if you're a tourist. But for, if you live here, that for a lot of people, that's actually how you've got to get to work or go to the shops or whatever. Uh, the route near me, for example, Tram 28, is, is probably one of the most beautiful trams routes um, or public transport routes in the world. Um, but it, I've t- 
taken it once since I've been here because I, I'll just never get on it. Like there will be queues of maybe 200 people at sort of the peak hour of the day. So one thing on the blog that I'm working on at the moment is trying to encourage people to to walk that route or to or to do it slightly differently, um, both for the sake of people living here, but also uh, for themselves as well. You know, you don't want to spend... Um, you know, an hour and or longer waiting to get just to get on um, public transport. Hopefully, the city officials are addressing this, though. I mean, it, it sounds like a pretty bad problem. Yeah, they're starting to slowly. I mean, Portugal's very, very dependent on tourism, and the things get done very, very slowly here in a lot of cases. Um, so uh, they have stopped handing out um, licenses for Airbnb and things like that. But I lived in Lisbon uh, in 2013, and, and I lived in Berlin in the same year. And at the same time as I lived there, both of them sort of saw a big tourism boom in in, in the sort of the next um, few years. And Berlin, you don't actually really notice it that much because it's a city of um, three million people, I think, and uh, it already had loads of um, excess accommodation and it's spread out. Um, it's really, really spread out. Lisbon's a much, much smaller city and, and Porto as well. Um, it's a lot more compact and so it's, it's i don't know i think it's quite a unique um situation for um for the uh, for lisbon and porto that the effects of uh, tourism has been so noticeable it's um for whatever reason people in all in one go started coming and writing about it and sharing about it on social media and and it, and it just all took off at the same time and i think the moral of the story here of course is that we've got to uh, get outside of lisbon and go and explore some of the other a- areas of portugal definitely i think i think that's probably is the um is the key to it thanks james and we'll share a link to your blog the portugalist in show notes it's absolutely full of information now do you want to win a trip to portugal and you know how to write then listen very very carefully all right because with us in the studio right now is Beck Day and Beck is the World Nomads Programs and Campaigns Coordinator which means you're organising the prize for the writing scholarship where are we where are we sending people Believe it or not, we're sending three lucky travel writers to Portugal. What a oh, surprise! <laughs> wow. So the applications have opened. We've already mentioned that in previous podcasts. Yes. Open for how long? Who to? What are you looking for? Head to www.worldnomads.com slash forward slash writing. Yep. And what you have to do to apply is um, s- submit a 700-word story. Um, picking one of the three themes about a travel experience that you've had. Yep. What are those three themes? First one's a leap into the unknown or making a local connection or I didn't expect to find. There's a whole judging process that we go through as well. And then the prize, let's reiterate what we've got there. Yeah, so the prize is amazing. Um, a round trip to Portugal and then you'll also get a... From anywhere? It doesn't matter where you are. From want. anywhere in the world. Okay. Um, you'll get a four-day workshop with professional... Um, New York Times contributor Tim Neville. Who we've had on the show a couple of yes. times. Yes. Good. Yeah. And then you'll get a 10-day trip around Portugal. And you have to write about Portugal? Yeah, we'll give you a few assignments to do on the way, but pretty much you'll get to do whatever you like. Real assignments, writing for World Nomads? Yep, and also you, Rail, who are one of our partners as well. Ah, oh, so yeah. you get published on both of those? Yeah, so you'll get $1,000 spending money as well, and then you also get a rail pass thrown in from you, Rail. Awesome. So that's all we need to know. Fantastic. Do you want to and hear about the judges? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. No, yeah. Other well, Tim's Tim one of them. Who yeah. else have we got? Yeah. So we've also got Nori Kintos, who's editor at large at National Geographic magazine. And we've also got Lola Akinmate, who writes for Adventure.com and National Geographic Traveler. What would, what would they know about writing? <laughs> no, not a thing. Have you read Tim's stuff? I know. Terrible. <laughs> no. They're brilliant writers and fantastic opportunity. And Look, some, this is all about turning a passion into a profession. We've spoken before to not only um, winners of writing scholarships but winners of the film scholarships and they go on to actually make money, careers yeah, no, out of these. we do turn it into a career, absolutely. Thanks for that. Thanks, no worries. Bec. So applications close 13th of March. All Good right. stuff. If you want to check out our other episodes of the World Nomads podcast, yeah, you might want to check out the one on Argentina. We're very candid people. We like um, hugging and kissing. Like whenever you um, arrive to a room, even if it's full of people, you will just kiss everyone. 
And so saying um, hi and bye takes ages, but you have to kiss everyone once you arrive and then before you go. But we only kiss once. I have so many funny stories um, when I was in Europe and I was trying to <laughs> kiss my new friends in the cheek because we kiss like in the right cheek. And they were like, oh, okay, this is unexpected. So they would try to kiss me on the other side because, you know, so many countries give two kisses. You'll find that episode in show notes, you can get the World Known Boats podcast on iTunes or download the Google Podcast app or ask Alexa and Google to play the World Nomads podcast. And Phil, to get in touch? Uh, podcast at worldnomads.com. And can I actually also say, I've just, I know you can get the podcast through all those devices. Can you help out with word of mouth, please, listeners? Can you tell your friends that you listen to the World Nomads podcast? That'd be great if you could do that for us. Uh, next week, we've got an amazing nomad. This is Susan Spann, all author and newly minted adventurer. See you then. Bye. The World Nomads Podcast. Explore your boundaries.